Welcome to Meet the Master, a monthly series by Pilgrim Center of Hope for one and all to encounter Jesus in his words and actions. You can find Meet the Master on our website or your favorite podcast app with a new episode the first Friday of every month. Now, we invite you to Meet Jesus, the Master. Hello and welcome to this month's Meet the Master. I am Mary Jane Fox. My husband, Deacon Tom, and I are the co-directors of Pilgrim Center of Hope. It's an evangelization apostolate serving since 1993. The theme for this Meet the Master audio retreat is True Beauty, Discovering God in Beauty. But first, let us begin with prayer. Lord Jesus, Master, we place ourselves before you. We are seeking to learn more about you and discover your goodness, your mercy, your beauty. O Lord, inspire us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We invite you to touch our hearts with your divine hand. Thank you. In your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. The beauty we see around us in the natural world can point our soul to the author of that beauty, the creator of the universe. There are many things in this world that can point our hearts to God, but one of the most effective means of leading a person to God is to the beauty of his creation, including sacred art. Today, I would like to discover that beauty through sacred art with you as, and how it has become an important element in our Christian faith. We will address the following. How has sacred art helped people through the centuries discover God? How can I approach sacred art to help me in my spiritual journey? When you hear the term sacred art, what first comes to your mind? Stained glass windows, a crucifix, jewelry? Well, let's define sacred art in the light of church teaching. I would go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In um, article number 2502 states, Sacred art is true and beautiful when its form corresponds to its particular vocation, evoking and glorifying, in faith and adoration, the transcendent mystery of God, the surpassing invisible beauty of truth and love visible in Christ. That's a very good definition. It really helps us to ponder what this means. Genuine sacred art draws man to adoration, to prayer, and to the love of God, our Creator, and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Sacred art has helped people through the centuries discover God. There is no institution in the history of the world that has made a greater contribution to the development of education, medicine, music, science, social reform and care of those in need, and art than the Catholic Church. Founded by Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church is God's plan for our salvation to guide us to our final destination, the heavenly Jerusalem. And that is why so often the church is represented by a boat. I really like that image. The boat is a symbolic, it's very symbolic here because the symbol is an invitation uh, is an, is to invite one to jump on board, <laughs> which contains, the ship contains members of the body of Christ and the boat welcomes those wanting to reach eternal life, the heavenly Jerusalem. So already you're hearing about one image of art used here, the boat, and so much can be said about this. The water, the boat, the sail. I mean, we really can expound on that. Uh, and this is what's so beautiful about sacred art. But from its very beginning, nearly 2,000 years ago, the Catholic Church has used art to instruct men and women about the faith, and to inspire them to live up to its high ideals. A strong tradition holds that St. Luke, the evangelist, was the first Catholic artist who created four icons of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, whose face he had actually seen in life. Mary, whom he actually knew in person. In iconography, the verb to write 
is used rather than to paint, as an icon is considered visual theology. Isn't that an interesting description of an icon, visual theology? Because an icon is to is a religious work of art created through prayer. And it, when you look at an icon, whether that of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ, or a, a scene from the Bible story, a biblical scene, it's to call us to ponder. To, it's to call us to think, to stop, to look at this piece. And wh- how, how does it speak to us? Is it inviting us to contemplate the mysteries of the faith? The four highly venerated icons of the Virgin Mary done by St. Luke, which are still venerated today, are the following. One is called Salus Popoli Romani. In English, the protectress of the Roman people. This icon is found in the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome. Pope Francis prays and often before this icon and offers flowers each time he leaves Rome for a pontifical journey, and again when he returns. He has a great devotion to Mary and believes that this icon painted by St. Luke is authentic, and so he, um, if this is one way that he venerates this icon in the Basilica of St. Mary Major. A second one is located in Poland, Our Lady of Czestochowa, which uh, is in Jasna Gora, Poland. Then there's one in Russia called Our Lady of Vladimir. And lastly, another one in Rome called Our Lady Perpetual Help. And again, you're probably wondering, well, if St. Luke painted these, or I should say, yes, painted these or wrote these icons through prayer, then why are they in Rome, Russia, and Poland? Well, that is another story (laughs) and could take a long time. But remember, you know, people... You know, Christianity spread from Jerusalem to Rome to other parts of the world, and with it, pilgrims, uh, disciples went and took some of these beautiful icons written, uh, created by St. Luke and other uh, pieces of art to other places where church communities were starting to encourage the faithful there. So uh, it, there's so much to be said there. That's why it's so beautiful to see the history of the church. You learn so much from every detail, really. Well, here's some information about St. Luke. You know, he's known as a fellow worker with St. Paul, an evangelist and the author of the gospel that bears his name. But he also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. Plus, he was a physician. Luke was obviously a well-educated and gifted, gifted man with many skills and abilities. He is the only one of the evangelists who lays out a full and in-depth account of the Annunciation and Incarnation, as well as Mary's visit to her cousin Elizabeth. What I mean by the Annunciation is the when the Archangel Gabriel visits Mary in Nazareth, as we read in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, and says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And it is at that time that the angel tells Mary she is to conceive through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Word made flesh, Christ himself. And the incarnation is, of course, it's all part of that um, whole uh, revel- um, beautiful story that we found in the Gospel of Luke. It is un- inconceivable that he might have met Mary himself, or is it? Why, well, I should say, is it inconceivable? Well, let's think about it. It's very possible that St. Luke spent time with Mary and actually knew her in person. During a pilgrimage, Tom and I led in in the footsteps of St. Paul. We were in Ephesus, which is today in Turkey, um, and it's one of the sites where Paul lived, uh, one of the places that uh, was on our pilgrimage journey. Uh, Ephesus was an ancient Roman city, a large city at that time. Paul lived there for a couple of years, and Mary also lived there after her son died on the cross, after he resurrected and ascended to heaven. The young apostle John took Mary, as Jesus told him to take, behold your mother, from the cross. He took Mary, and they went to Ephesus. Paul spent uh, time in Ephesus in around the year 53. Luke uh, was a companion of St. Paul and would travel with him uh, on some of his missionary journeys. 
But while in Ephesus, we saw a marking stating that that, it, that there was um, a site marked the tomb of St. Luke. And after researching this, we found out that it was possible that Luke was buried in this area, and then later his body was taken to Padua, Italy, where today it is enshrined in the church of St. Justina, which is not far from the Basilica of St. Anthony of Padua uh, in Padua, Italy. As we see some of these facts, it is conceivable that Luke may have spent time with Mary, very, very likely, according to the tradition of our church with the capital T, many of the writings that we find documented. And as mentioned earlier, the first two chapters of this gospel are in-depth accounts of the Annunciation and her visit to her cousin Elizabeth and, of course, the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. When Christianity began, Christians may have been constrained by their position as a persecuted group from producing durable works of art. They were considered a lower class and often would be martyred if they were um, known to the public as Christians. So we don't find much at that time period, but going to the second and third centuries, we do have evidence of Christian art, especially in the catacombs in Rome. In the first century of Rome's Christians, they did not really have their own cemeteries. If they owned land, they buried their relatives. They would have, obviously would bury their relatives there. Otherwise, they resorted to common cemeteries where pagans too were buried. And that is how St. Peter came to be buried in the great public necropolis. It's called the City of the Dead on Vatican Hill, which was available to everybody. Of course, today, the Basilica of St. Peter is built over the tomb of St. Peter. In the first half of the second century, as a result of various grants and donations, the Christians started burying their dead underground. And that is how the catacombs were found. Many of them began and developed around family tombs, whose owners nearly would be newly converted Christians, did not reserve them to the members of the family, but opened them to their brethren in the faith, to their brothers and sisters in Christ. As time went on, these burial areas grew larger by gifts or by the purchase of new properties, sometimes on the initiative of the church itself. One example is the catacombs of St. Callistus in Rome, which covers around 12 miles with various levels and had around a half a million bodies buried, including many popes, saints, and martyrs. The earliest surviving artworks are the painted frescoes on the walls of these catacombs. And I'd like to describe some of these. I've seen them myself while on pilgrimage to Rome. One of my favorite sites is the catacombs because of its history, its meaning, and the, uh, the sacred art and its symbolism. One of them is the Good Shepherd. Well, of course, we know the Good Shepherd is the symbol of Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, who calls himself, I am the Good Shepherd in the Gospels. The dove is another sign, which we can think of as the dove is the symbol of the Holy Spirit or peace. A person standing with arms raised in prayer. Now, why would this be in the catacombs? You know, it's a sign of Christianity in the sense that as a, uh, at that time period, you know, it was very common for Christians when they gather, when they assemble together um, for worship, for mass, they would raise their hands. It would be easy, for, it would be very common for them to raise their hands in prayer, in prayer, but also in praising God, praising God for the gift of who he is, for the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life. Then you also find birds and flowers. Birds and flowers are symbols of life, and especially new life, new life in Christ. The Alpha and the Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. They signify that Christ is the beginning and end of all things. And then you find a symbol of the fish. Why a fish? Well, Greek was a major language during that time period, and the word for fish in Greek is ictus, spelled I-X-T-H-Y-S, ictus. Each letter in this word begins with the words that spell out Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Now, isn't that clever and interesting of Christians at that time period? 
they could not wear the crucifix like we do today or a cross on a chain and to, to show people that we are Christians or they couldn't ha- hang a cross on their wall. Uh, at that time, really, the, cru- the cross was still an instrument of death. Christians were being crucified at that time. And so it was considered an instrument of death. It was um, something that um, they, they would see and they would see their brothers and sisters crucified. It was that part of the persecution of the Christians in the, in the Roman Empire. And so the fish was known to be a sign of, uh, for Christians, they would greet one another by carving, by um, tracing the fish on, uh, on the ground, or even secretly by tracing a cross on the, full, the, the, full, uh, the forehead of the other person. So the Christian catacombs are extremely important for the history of early Christian art as they contain the greatest majority of examples both in fresco and sculpture. So you can see already how important sacred art came to be because they symbolized faith, hope, eternal life. Um, in the midst of persecution and the midst of the hardship that they were experiencing at that time. Let's fast forward to the 4th century in the year 312. Rome becomes Christian and Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, builds churches. Now, the Emperor Constantine defeated his principal rival at the Battle of Milvian Bridge in Rome. Accounts of the battle described by credible historians tell how Constantine saw a sign in the heavens signifying his victory. What was that sign? The sign he saw was the cross. He began to build churches in Rome. His uh, Christianity was more um, public. He, his mother, Helena, began, she, she traveled to, hold, to the Holy Land and initiated her son to build uh, churches in the Holy Land. So she started to build a church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, which is built over the birthplace of Christ, the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre of uh, the, Holy, the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem, which is built over the tomb of Christ and part of Calvary, and the Church of the Our Father on the Mount of Olives, built over the place or the grotto, the area where Jesus would gather with his disciples, his apostles, and teach them to pray on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem. So the sacred art took a big turn with new symbols, with signs, and color. But So, again, just to give you a brief, that was a brief history, and as, as time goes on, I mean, certainly there's, you know, stained glass windows came into place. These, um, we started seeing the crucifix, the cross now more evident uh, in public um, life uh, as worn around the neck, uh, uh, hanging on the wall as, in the home of a Christian. Uh, this were a sign of victory over death, a sign of hope because of Christ's death on the cross was indeed the sign of victory and hope and obviously the mercy of God. How can I approach sacred art to help me in my spiritual journey? Well, I'd like to um, introduce you to uh, Lexio Visio. Alexio viso is two Latin words, which means prayerfully seeing something beautiful. Like Lexio Divina is prayerfully reading the scriptures, taking the scripture, let's say, for example, a gospel passage or the gospel of the day that is read in the liturgical calendar in our Catholic faith, and reading it slowly, pondering, asking the Holy Spirit, of course, to inspire you, and, and oftentimes, in, in really done sincerely in prayer, uh, the Holy Spirit does um, allow you to be to realize a word or a phrase from that gospel passage to take to heart and meditate on that. Well, now Lexio Visio is taking art and praying with art, if I can say it that way. Let's describe it. The early church fathers described the purpose of religious images is to lead one upward, okay? Uh, We don't worship images. (laughs) They are to lead us in prayer, to remind us of what they mean. 
These symbols that I described earlier in the catacombs, the good shepherd, the dove, birds, flowers, they weren't things that we worshiped. I mean, obviously the good shepherd was a symbol of the good shepherd, Jesus Christ himself. But the, the statues that came afterwards, the stained glass windows, we don't worship the art piece. It is reminding us of the source of leading our soul upward and be reminded of the kingdom of God. So these church fathers wrote that this art should raise the soul and mind to the kingdom of God, to eternal life. In modern times, Pope John Paul II has written, he said, iconography is based on the mystery of the incarnation in which God chose to assume a human face. Sacred art seeks to transmit something of the mystery of that face. So this art then is like a window into heaven itself, huh? Sacred art is beautiful to the eye and enriching to the spirit. And that's why we are calling it true beauty. Catholic art has always told the story of the faith. Originally, this was done through symbols, such as we said earlier, the, you know, the fish and others. And later in life, later through history, um, the anchor was also a sign. Remember how we, I said earlier, the boat was a symbol of the church. The anchor is a sign of hope, something to grasp and to hold on to, or of faith. And later through iconography and paintings in which saints held an item which helped the viewer identify them, and later still through highly detailed de depictions of scriptural scenes and life stories of saints. So this, uh, this is how we began to see then iconography. And then today, of course, modern um, portraits. John Paul II saw the importance of sacred art and wrote a letter to artists. And in it, he reminds us of the importance of fostering creati creativity among artists whose imagination reflect the many ways in which God communicates with us and we with God. But then again, so now how do we approach this? Lexio visio in my spiritual journey, how can I embrace this? Well, with our culture becoming more and more visually oriented, an intentional way of guiding ourselves or others to meditate or ponder sacred art is needed now more than ever. That Visio Divina invites us to um, see more of a contemplative um, pace. So it invites us to see all there is to see, to see deeply beyond first and second impressions, beyond any initial ideas, judgments or understandings. Yes. It invites us to be seen, addressed, surprised, transformed by God, who is never limited or tied to any image, but speaks through them. So here's a simple guide. First step. Ask the Holy Spirit, implore God, the Holy Spirit, to show you something as you see an image, an art piece. We're talking about sacred art or, or even a beautiful uh, natural art. I mean, a natural wonder that God has created. How do we do this? Well, for example, when walking into a church for the first time, do you see an art piece, an icon, a statue that just attracts you? Or on pilgrimage, when you're on a journey, perhaps even a vacation, this is a great opportunity because we have opportunities to see something new. Are we seeing, what, do we, what beauty do we see in it? Beauty from the art itself or from the natural um, beauty of what God has created. So invite the Holy Spirit to help you see beauty in your daily life as we walk through life. Uh, the second is, let's say we did now choose a specific um, art piece. Look at that image. Take your time and let your feelings, your thoughts come to you. What do you see in the forms, the lines, color, features, the shape? What, what do you like about it? What do you not like? If you don't like the image, simply acknowledge that this is your initial response and continue to stay open to the image and, and prayer since it was initially attracted, it attracted you to that image. The next is, 
Be aware of any assumptions or expectations that you can bring to the image. No matter what your response is to the image, whether it be uh, one of delight or indifference or confused, or you, you ponder that prayerfully, the reason for your various responses and what those responses might meet, mean for you. Does it bring about for you important meanings or values or remind you of an important event or season or suggest a new or different way of being? How do you find yourself wanting to respond to what you are experiencing? And lastly, take the time to respond to God in ways that will help you through in your prayer, in your gratitude, in your wonder, your lament, your confession, your praise. I'd like to tell you a story of a woman who experienced um, something with sacred art. Many years ago, I, I was on a, a cruise with a, um, a group of people, um, and in my previous career, I was uh, a travel agent, and one of my duties was to lead groups on specific um, destinations, and this one was on a cruise through the um, through Europe. And one of, our de- one of our stops was Dubrovnik. At that time, it was called Yugoslavia. Today, it's Croatia. And Dubrovnik has uh, an ancient city built on rock. It's it's called the Golden City because when the sun sets, hits on it, it looks golden at a certain time of day. It's, it's quite unique, very historical. And as our tour was going through this old city, one of the ladies in our group was a retired um, army cr- colonel, single, never married, and she was uh, traveling alone with, but had friends in the group. And she, um, we, we had all stopped, and so I was walking with her, and, and as our group went through this one tour, the guide took us to a, a, an old Franciscan monastery, and in this monastery was a large painting hanging on the wall of St. Dominic praying over a, uh, a sick child uh, who, um, who was on its mother's lap. The reason we stopped there was not because it was a religious tour, no, it was a secular tour, but the guy wanted us to see the painting um, in a light of the artist. The artist used only three colors, and I thought, how can he use three colors? I see so many in this painting, and that was the whole point. He said at one time, this one artist was so, um, his genius took him to be so creative in the different hues and so on. And he explained it in a very beautiful way. It was secular, but it was very beautiful in the sense of seeing how this artist was so gifted in this way with the three colors, and yet we saw so many different hues. Well, um, the group went on, and so someone had asked a question, oh, by the way, what is that painting about? Who is it? And, of course, he explained Myself, I was obviously I was you know faithful Catholic, and I knew I was attracted to it in both ways, the way that it was explained artistically, but also in a sacred way, knowing uh, the saint and looking at it in two ways, you know. So that was what sacred art to me was about. At that poem, that moment was was so beautiful. It really, really can take a lot of time just looking at this piece. Well, one of the ladies, this retired colonel, stayed behind, and I thought, oh my, you know, we have to get on with the group. We're going to lose the group, and I didn't want to push her because I, I knew I, I saw how she was so in, intent. She was so focused and, uh, on this painting. Well, we caught up with the group eventually, and that night uh, on the cruise ship, as we were having our nice dinner on the white linen tablecloth and wine, and we were enjoying our conversation, talking about the day. Uh, In the middle of the table were some roses. Well, the roses um, reminded this one lady, this uh, retired colonel, uh, to say, to ask the question, did anybody smell roses as we were standing in front of that painting? Everybody looked at each other. No, we didn't. I didn't. Did you? No. And so no one smelled roses. But this colonel did. And she looked at, and I looked at her. I was sitting next to her, and I leaned over, and I, I said her name. I said, and I'll call her Miss Colonel. I said, Miss Colonel, uh, I said, I can tell you that the when people smell roses, sometimes it can be a sign of God's presence or the Holy Spirit, um, you know, coming to us. And so she looked at me intently and very seriously, and she said, 
I don't really go to church or believe in God. She goes, I need to talk to you after the meal. So we met somewhere um, after the meal. She looked at me and she says, why did you say that to me? I thought, oh my, I might lose my job here. And she said, because <laughs> that was my responsibility used to be, used to take care of this group. And she, she was so curious. Why did you tell me this? I don't pray. I don't go to church. I don't even think of God. You know, what I do on my spare time is I'm an artist. I paint and I, I thought, ah, I thought to myself, so that's why she was looking at this piece of art. So she says, well, why would God send me these roses you're telling me about, this scent? I said, well, you know, uh, Miss Colonel, and I, I don't know exactly the words I used, but what I, my message to her was, God was reading your heart. He knew, he knows who you are, and he knew the gift of art he, you had. After all, everything comes from him. And so it was like his way of telling you he loves you. Well, she was very emotional. She began to cry. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this woman who I admired, you know, this retired, retired, retired colonel. And she was such a very educated woman, a very experienced through life, her travels. I started crying. And we both cried. And finally, she just said, you know, she was so thankful for that. And later, um, you know, she just, her, her countenance changed. She just started being a happier person. I could see that the remainder of the journey. But that story stuck to me all through these years. And I think that's a very good story for us to think about, that God will speak to us. This is, this is sacred art, to, to remind us to look upward and to allow God to speak to us. Pope Benedict XVI said, There is a connection between beauty and the Christian vocation to manifest the presence of the living God in this world, which he still loves. To be fully Christian is to be fully human. Friends, this is a beautiful insight on sacred art. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Let me know what you thought about this. Contact us at pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Uh, join me as we close with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to benefit from the beauty of all that your hand has created. O oh Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. We are blessed to be the recipients of all the beauty that surrounds us and testifies of your awesome glory. May all our thoughts be pleasing to you, for we rejoice in you, Father. Bless us and grant us the grace that's needed each day to be aware of your presence, your beauty, and to live our faith. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. We have, close, we have come to the close of this episode of Meet the Master. Thank you for joining me. Let me know what you thought of this episode. Contact me at pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Until next time, God bless you. Thank you for listening to this month's Meet the Master. We are so grateful to our sponsors who made this podcast possible. Would you like to help others meet the Master? Direct them to listen to the podcast on the Pilgrim Center of Hope website or on apps like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Amazon Music. And if you listen using an app, please take a few seconds to give the podcast a positive rating. Your simple action will signal to the app that Meet the Master should be recommended to people who are browsing for a new podcast to listen to. As we say at Pilgrim Center of Hope, every little bit helps. Thanks for helping us spread the word about Meet the Master. Look forward to next month's journey as we continue to meet the Master. From all of us at Pilgrim Center, I hope God bless you.